the unit's first Google Plus Hangout. Uh, today we focus on ending new HIV infections among children across the world. We have three illustrious guests with us today. Uh, joining us from London is Ali, Annie Lennox, Goodwill Ambassador of UNAIDS and a well-known singer. From uh, New York in our office, Michelle Sidibe, the Executive Director of UNAIDS, who first made the call for ending uh, new child infections in 2009. Uh, and from Washington, D.C., the Ambassador for the Elizabeth Glazer Pediatric AIDS Foundation, uh, Florence Gaboni. Every day, there are about 900 children born with HIV. We can end each one of them. If you look at the United States, if you look at the United Kingdom or elsewhere in the world, there are almost no children born with HIV. But why is it that 330,000 children are born elsewhere? This discussion is about putting an end to it. There are three ways in which we can put an end to it. First is to make sure that women across the world do not get infected. If women are not infected, no child is infected. Second. There are 17 million women living with HIV. Many of them don't want to have children. If we can make sure that they have access to reproductive health services, family planning services, then children won't be born. But each year, there are about 1.5 million women living with HIV who do get pregnant. And for them, we need access to antiretroviral medicines. The same medicines that saves people's lives also protects a mother from passing on the infection to their child. And that is what we are doing all over the world, is to provide access to antiretroviral medicines to mothers. And finally, if children are born with HIV and the mothers who give birth to children also need to stay alive for, to bring the children up. So we have to give access to women as well. This is what UNAIDS is, is doing with the global plan that we launched two years ago, and Annie was part of it, and Florence was part of it, and Michelle spearheaded it, and showing results on the ground. Let me bring you one story from Ghana, where a couple has taken action, uh, and they are telling you how they can protect the children from HIV. You know what you're going to learn in school today? Yes. Wonderful. You go, you learn. Uh -huh. Sorry, madam, I will come there, OK? Mm -hmm. okay. So Charity and Ibrahim, their son Janai, is a gift. I, I always say he always give me joy. Mm. I feel proud. He's my child. The couple who live in Accra in Ghana feel particularly blessed because Janai was born HIV free. Charity was diagnosed with HIV shortly after her first husband died ten years ago. Five years later, she married Ibrahim. He does not have HIV. When she uh, announced, I started to me. I, I was cool with it since I felt that I, I love her and HIV cannot kill me because I'm living a positive life. Charity knew that the antiretroviral drug she was taking to protect her life would also protect her child from HIV. I was determined to have a negative child. So my clinical days, my drugs, my everything was very always important to me. The risk of a child getting HIV can be reduced to less than 5% if ARVs are made available to them and their mothers. And you're using condom, how do you get pregnant? Take them through the PMTCC. But even though the virus can be stopped, 1,000 babies are born with HIV every day. UNAIDS Executive Director Michelle Sidibe has made stopping new HIV infections among children by 2015 a top priority. And we want Ghana able to lead this uh, baby free of HIV. Thank you for your work. You agree, eh? When you will be, when, when you will be president. Uh... UNAIDS and its partners have launched the Global Plan towards the elimination of new HIV infections among children and keeping their mothers alive. Ghana is one of 22 priority countries and is speeding up efforts to reach pregnant women with HIV services. We started in 2003 with just 23 clients, but now we test thousands of women a year. <laughs> For mothers like Charity, getting access to essential <laughs> HIV services can't happen soon enough. She wants her joy 
to be the same for mothers everywhere. Clap for Judy. Michelle, 24% down in new infections in just 24 months. Tremendous progress. How is it happening and why is this very important to you? You know, for me, is uh, stopping the transmission from mother to child is uh, certainly politically, socially, and economically the right things to do. It is not uh, costly. $150 and you can stop the transmission from mother to child. And if this baby is born with HIV, it will cost the society $300,000 only on treatment costs. But we know also that uh, when we manage to stop the transmission from mother to child, it is the beginning of the end of the epidemic. It is also socially correct because you don't just save this baby. You're saving also the mother because you're reaching the mother and you're giving them a treatment. And by giving them treatment, you're making them capable to also raise the children who are born who will not be orphaned. So for me, it is uh, uh, very important that we continue uh, to implement the global plan we are seeing a great result. We are quickening the pace of action every single place. Country like South Africa, a reduction by almost, uh, uh, we are reaching almost 95% of uh, pregnant women with uh, services today, which were not uh, just even part of our dream a few years ago. So I think, uh, like you said, uh, uh, what used to take uh, us uh, uh, 10 years in terms of result is taking us today uh, less than uh, 24 months. So uh, we are uh, achieving the same result. It's time to support uh, uh, the countries. It's time to demonstrate that uh, uh, our action, uh, which was producing result, need to be sustained. And that is where we need the political uh, leaders to accompany uh, this uh, right uh, movement of uh, stopping the transmission from mother to child and also keeping the mother alive. Thank you, Michelle. And I'm sure you'll agree that uh, in this effort, uh, international personalities have played a big role in convincing political leadership about it. And one of the persons at the forefront is, uh, is, is Annie. Annie, you've, you've been very, very vocal and very passionate about ending uh, new infections among children and making sure that children get access to treatment. Uh, what drives you and, and what have you seen in this last uh, 24 months? Well, first of all, I think the main thing that drives me is because I'm a mother. I have two healthy, wonderful girls, and I'm so grateful to have them on the planet. And I feel that it should be the right of every woman who is expecting a baby to deliver the most healthy child they can have. And when it comes to HIV and AIDS, in a country like South Africa, where you have one in three pregnant women who are HIV positive, you are talking about a third of the future generation of the nation of South Africa being born with HIV if you don't have the intervention. Now, as Michelle so beautifully pointed out, the intervention is, is there. It can be done, it can be rolled out, it can be accessed. We don't have to have one child born with HIV, and we don't have to have the mother dying so that child is left in orphanage. It's a win-win situation. I completely back it. And um, I just feel so privileged that I've been part of a collective effort to bring about some kind of transformative change in a human rights issue that sh should never have been in 10 years ago, I have to say. Michelle, it's so beautiful what you explained to, to, to people. Many people watching this today, they won't know some of the facts. Because for many people, HIV and AIDS with regard to women and children is still an abstraction. They have no idea that this is happening. And why is that? Why is the voice being so silent? And why for one whole decade in the country of South Africa was the president creating a bottleneck with his health minister at that time? So we can see that politicians can either give us the opportunity to make the transformative changes for their citizens or they can bottleneck them. Now we have an opportunity and we, we need to go with it. We need to drive forward. Uh, indeed, um, South Africa is, is, is a good case and example, as you said. Now they've scaled up services to about 95% of all pregnant women in the country. Florence, you're living proof of what can happen when services are provided. You're from South Africa yourself. Uh, tell us your story, I mean, of how you looked at this issue and, and why you are such a powerful force 
in changing women's lives, especially in your home country? Well, the global plan mentions the fact that we need to involve HIV positive women in decision making, but also in the plenary uh, sessions. I'm one of those women who has given a chance as an HIV positive mother to be involved in, in most of these things, and including advocacy itself. I wouldn't be an advocate if it wasn't for my story. Um, 16 years ago, I was diagnosed with HIV. And I find out through my baby, Namtunzi, who then passed away uh, because of HIV, but also my husband passed away. Over the years, I have managed to give counseling to women who are HIV positive. I've managed to also play a huge role in advocacy for accessibility of services for women, and especially young women at the childbearing age. I believe that the work that we are all putting in this has made a difference because today my life is different. Being an educated HIV positive person, I mean educated in terms of I know what services should be provided to an HIV positive person like myself. I went out with my husband, uh, my current husband who's HIV negative, to look for those services. We were blessed with two children whom I uh, went through PMTCT services for, and I received ARVs through my pregnancy, all my tr uh, two pregnancies. And wonderfully, I, I have two HIV negative children. So we can eliminate vertical transmission. I am the hope, and I am the future. And my children are a good example of the two leadership that we see here, the leadership of um, Michelle Sidibe, uh, the leadership of any all your effortless uh, work that you have done as advocates, but also trying to make sure that there's funding for programs and making sure that there are continued services that, that are provided for women all over the world. Thank you. Uh, Florence, I'm going to ask you one follow-up question. Why is it that not enough women are coming forward to access services, especially HIV testing? Both men and women are not getting tested in big numbers. Well, we still need to make sure that women get uh, to know about the services that can be rendered to them and demand the, those services. Um, I think the fact that we still need more education to be done at a community level to make sure that women who are HIV positive even before they conceive children, they know what they're getting themselves into. They know that when they get into the clinics before 14 weeks of being pregnant, they need to access ARVs to prevent mother-to-child transmission. They should know that uh, there are ARVs that can be accessed and demand them if they are not being given to them. So I think the education shows that we still have a long way to support community projects and also to talk about stigma and discrimination to make sure that women are not scared to go to the clinics because of the level of stigma in the community and in the clinics as well. We've seen how women are scared to take up services because they are afraid that they will be yelled at by doctors or nurses and how some of them will be compelled to sterilize because of HIV. So we need to make sure that that doesn't happen. Women have a right to their sexual and reproductive rights regardless of their HIV status. Yeah, the sterilization issues is, is a big one. And, and Michelle, you have spoken out against forced sterilization of women living with HIV. Um, your stand on that has been very, very clear. What do you, uh, what do you say to governments uh, who are looking uh, at the human rights angle uh, on uh, elimination of new infections among children? Uh, you know, first of all, I want to say that uh, uh, Florence uh, is just uh, showing us that that is not a dream. That it could happen. She uh, she is today uh, uh, managed to fight and to have a, a, a reproductive health uh, uh, respected, and uh, she has uh, two babies who are born uh, without uh, HIV. So for me, uh, she should not be an exception, and that's why I personally believe that uh, uh, AIDS is showing us. Uh, that if you don't deal with human rights, if you don't restore dignity of people, even if you give them help, it will not work. Uh, human rights is not uh, just about uh, uh, dealing uh, with uh, uh, people in isolation. It's uh, about making society better. It's rejecting those type of uh, uh, 
criminal laws which are existing in some places, which are uh, making people running away from services. And our uh, job is uh, to just uh, give a voice uh, uh, to those voiceless and help uh, countries to reform uh, uh, those uh, punitive laws and uh, making sure that uh, uh, society become built around uh, compassion and tolerance, but not uh, uh, refusing uh, to this lady to have a right to have a baby uh, in the condition which is the most uh, dignified way. Talking about rights to the voiceless, Annie, you've been uh, out into the villages, into the towns, meeting with women. What are the women telling you? Um, basically, that when women are in isolation, and the stigma is so powerful and so strong that there's no dialogue and there's no information, proper information being exchanged, this is a very um, challenging place to be. And women, ostensibly, in many developing countries, um, are so unable to access their rights. And so, as Michelle just pointed out, very much so that HIV and AIDS is coming down directly through not just a health issue, but a human rights issue. And so, when we're talking about women getting access to treatment, we're also talking about women in a broader sense becoming more empowered to know their legal rights, their logistical rights, their sexually reproductive health care rights. Those are issues. So you can't just separate HIV and AIDS from gender. And I'm very conscious of this, especially the fact that I know as a Western woman um, that I've had those privileges and those benefits. And sometimes we, as Western women, have tended to take these things for granted. And what I think would be the, the move forwards is very much about the evolution of, for me, I use the word feminism because in the context of empowerment of women, I'm very, very proud to use that word. And I think that the reinvention of the word must go through and forwards to women in developing countries. Thank you, Annie. In fact, Michelle, uh, we've been receiving emails and Twitters from around people watching us. And one of the questions they're asking you is, is based on what Annie was saying, is why should gender equality and gender-based violence programming matter. Uh, this is coming to us from the Sexual Violence Research Initiative. So they're asking you, why should gender equality and gender-based violence programs matter in our uh, AIDS response? You know, HIV uh, is, uh, was able to show us that uh, AIDS is about uh, also an opportunity. It's not just a problem. It is an opportunity to really look at the society by large. And uh, we realized that uh, through our data collection, through the analysis, uh, that uh, when the women are not uh, having equal rights, when they are not uh, having the possibility to negotiate their sexuality in a responsible and free manner, they, they become taken hostage. So we cannot uh, in, uh, accept uh, violence against women. We are seeing in uh, many places uh, after the war and uh, even in stable situation that uh, more and more young girls are just uh, raped. And uh, because they are raped, they become pregnant. And because they are pregnant, uh, they are abandoned by uh, the system. And uh, then they found themselves uh, having a children uh, born with HIV. So we, we should not accept that. But HIV is just uh, the metaphor of HIV is clearly showing that uh, it is inequality, is a gender inequality, and uh, that's why we need to address that. And unless we are we are able to really address uh, uh, these um, issues between the society and engaging the men, I think it will uh, be very difficult for us to uh, deal with HIV. HIV is about uh, maternal health, it's about child health, it's about reproductive health like Florence and uh, Annie was just mentioning, but uh, it's about uh, uh, fighting against uh, uh, violence, uh, uh, you know, in society, particularly violence against women. Thank you, Michelle, and thank you for talking about male involvement. I mean, the involvement of men in this program is equally critical. Florence, in your opinion, how, how are men part of this movement? Well, you know, in my country there have been an attempt of involving men. I still believe that we need to look at other issues that men are not coming forward to even come for just simple things like male circumcision. 
So I still think that we need to still educate the community about the importance of how men can play a role in the prevention of, of mother to child, but also in, in just being as responsible community members who can play a role in health. So we still need to try and make sure we talk to men. There's a whole lot of issues around confidentiality as well. If we can guarantee confidentiality to most people and respect them, uh, regardless of who they are, we could see more and more people coming forward. The other thing is the whole blame issue. I think we also need to talk to men more and find out what are the key issues that we're missing out. There must be something we're missing out. Do I have an answer for you? No. But I think men should be involved. Any, any thoughts on your end on getting men involved? Well, both Michelle and Florence have really uh, highlighted this issue of gender inequality so beautifully. Um, and I'm just very, I couldn't agree more, more with both of you. And um, also I feel that in a sense, very much that men need to be addressed in a way where they feel heard. That men very much feel a separate, there's a sort of separation. And, the, and as you said, Florence, you don't have an answer. I also don't have an answer, but I think that the inclusivity of men and the and the bringing of awareness of their role in all of this, and of course about um, transformation in social behaviour, is terribly important. And when you have uh, societies where you have tremendous violence, where rape is used as a weapon of warfare in so many countries like the Congo, etc., we have seen you know the ravages that that, that brings. Surely there must be a place for intervention, and and uh, as you said, Michelle, human rights, human rights above all everything. It's about human beings. It's not only about a health issue. Uh, thank you. In fact, Annie, uh, before we go, we just received another uh, email message, which then this is from Designers Against AIDS, based in Belgium, uh, and they're asking you as to how the, how can young fashion designers contribute to the goal of ending. Uh, HIV infections among children. You want to have a first go at it? Yes, I'd love to. I think that starts as a challenge. If you're a fashion designer and this issue is of interest to you, then you can find out in some way with your curiosity how can you do that. I mean, of course, there are so many, many wonderful NGOs I have supported and I am involved with. Mothers to Mothers, Treatment Action Campaign that you mentioned earlier, Florence, so many of these uh, wonderful organizations that are doing great work, but there is also room for invention. If you want to raise money, maybe you can have an event. You know, if you want to raise awareness, perhaps you can start to talk, even at your own individual level with your friends, people that don't know the facts. The dialogue doesn't happen here. People still think that HIV and AIDS is some kind of gay issue that has been dealt with back in the 80s. They are so wrong. HIV AIDS is a massive thing that is still taking place and affecting women and children. And actually, as activists and advocates, and um, we, are, we have been doing something about it, is the UN AIDS statistics have recently proved the mortality rate is going down. We're seeing successes. People are getting access. These are things we couldn't have dreamt of. 10 years ago. So become part of it. Don't just sit passively on your couch and do nothing. Find out the way that you can be involved. There are many, many ways to do it. Uh, and talking about many ways to do it, Michelle, what is it that got us the results that we are seeing today? This, this fast acceleration as you talked about it. That we're doing things in 24 months that we haven't done in uh, 10 years. What can individuals like us individually uh, do to further accelerate that? You know, I think uh, a, a living example are um, Annie Lennox uh, and uh, Florence. Uh, their uh, individual commitment, uh, their advocacy every day is helping us uh, to reach uh, the political leaders. And uh, by reaching political leaders, we are breaking the conspiracy of silence. By breaking the conspiracy of silence, we are creating space uh, for uh, making sure that the service could be m made available for poor people. And I'm seeing in many places today, a government uh, uh, trying to really take uh, the response, owning the response. Uh, and for me, that is the best hope because uh, resources which are made available will be certainly used in more transparent manner 
to reach uh, communities. Uh, and that we need uh, to reinforce uh, our effort uh, for uh, greater accountability. We need uh, to make sure that uh, we uh, support uh, the community uh, models and also we uh, advocate strongly for more uh, innovation because uh, still uh, uh, drugs price is high and still uh, we know that most of our people in uh, Africa uh, who, are, who need those treatment or on treatment of first line treatment, they will need to move second line, third line, and if we don't uh, have a possibility to reduce the price of medicine, uh, we will not be able to give them the same chance. We should not forget that uh, 7 million people are waiting for treatment. That is not over, and uh, those people's life are hanging in the balance, and we need to give them the same chance. Florence, your ideas on what people can do to help the common person on the street? Well, we need to make sure that there's continuity of uh, resources that uh, are supported for especially NGOs uh, that are small and at the community level that can make a difference. We also need to make sure that our leaders and researchers are working together with communities, with HIV positive people, but also they are hearing and, and involving men as well. Uh, at the same time, to eliminate pediatric HIV, we also know that we need accessibility to services like uh, ARVs. We must make sure that um, you know, leaders are taking this forward without any hesitation but also make sure that at a global, uh, at a global, you know, there's a global movement to make sure that everyone, regardless of where they are, so stakeholders have a share as well in making a difference. Um, at the same time, we need to also make sure that we don't just uh, involve people living with HIV, but we take them seriously. We take their voices seriously, and women at all levels can feel that they have something for themselves in all these programs. And at the same time, to encourage uh, people like Michelle Sidibe and any not to give up, and any other advocates who, who think they can have a voice that can be taken forward to come forward and join us as well. Honey, a thousand days left to go before we have to end a new infections among children, and we have about three minutes to go before we close. Closing thoughts. I am just so thrilled to have had this wonderful dialogue and exchange with you and to be hosted by Google today. It's, it's a beautiful stage. We feel very uh, delighted about this because it is often very hard for us as advocates to have access. We are always fighting for access to frontline headlines. You know, HIV and AIDS gets relegated to very, you know, we have it once a year we have on the 1st of December the Global AIDS Day, and this is an opportunity to coalesce and to just once again we come around. But actually it's a pity, you know, that we will have to wait for an entire year or maybe for the Global AIDS Conference every second year that we have the opportunity to have the platform. So I would say I feel very grateful that Google have taken this seriously. I feel that in partnership with you that this can help to, to magnify the collective voice of all the AIDS activists around the globe. Florence, thousand days to go. Your thoughts? Well, I'm an ambassador for the Elizabeth Glacier, and I believe they have done an amazing job with, you know, partners like UNAIDS, partners like USAID. You know, I believe that if we know what to do, we can always help them to fundraise to make sure that children access these ARVs all over the world. We can also support their work in in terms of making sure that. We talk to others about what they are doing and how they can be involved as advocates. There's always a room open for more advocates, uh, more room open for more of our ambassadors to come and talk to them or anybody else. But together, you can see how more and more other stakeholders can make a difference. Michelle, uh, Michelle's work, UNAIDS, is also making sure that they are committees all over the world uh, involving HIV positive people and making sure that their voices are heard. And we know that people like any Linux are always wearing that HIV positive shirt, which I love. Um, I wish if I was wearing the same thing. So more and more money is needed. We are not finished yet. The fight has not ended yet. 
We need to put more money into research. We need to put more money into resources within the community level. We also need to empower and educate HIV positive people. There's a lot of work to be done around community uh, involvement everywhere else to make sure people demand services and they know that their voices can be heard. Thank you. Michelle, you call yourself an incorrigible optimist. A thousand days to go. What is the hope for you? You know, achieving a zero new HIV infections in children is possible. It is not the dream. Uh, we are already showing uh, the way. Uh, the next uh, thousand uh, days will be critical. It will be a test uh, to our uh, global commitment. Everyone, I said, everyone needs uh, to get active now. And uh, I am sure we will be with the support of uh, all those uh, who are already mobilized. Like uh, Google, I want to thank you. We will be able to achieve uh, zero new infection among uh, children and keep the mother alive by 2015. And I hope that will happen and uh, because it will be the best, best legacy of our fight uh, to this world. Thank you very much. On that positive note, thank you all very much for joining us in UNAIDS, the first Google Plus Hangout. We'll have more of these. We won't wait for another AIDS conference before we all get together again. And uh, we'll have another opportunity to talk with you all. Thank you very much indeed, and have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.